There are seven criteria we can use to test the strength of hypotheses. Some of them are more important than others, and not all of them are going to apply in every single case. Further, there's not an algorithm that we can use to test the relative strength of hypotheses against one another. None of this, however, diminishes the importance of these criteria. In this lecture, we're going to summarize each of the criteria and look at some examples that both violate and satisfy each of them. We'll start then with informativeness. Remember that informativeness has two parts. To say that an explanation is informative is to say that it is both meaningful and that it is complete. So here would be an example. I wasn't able to pay my bills because I lacked sufficient funds in my checking account. On the face of it, this might seem like a meaningful explanation. However, if you think about it, it really doesn't say anything. What's at issue here is why you didn't have enough money in your checking account in the first place. To say then that you can't pay your bills because you lack sufficient funds really doesn't provide any sort of explanation. The second example is better. I didn't go to the game because my friend called me. That's certainly meaningful, but it's not very complete. Did the fact that your friend called you keep you from going to the game because you talked for hours on end? Or did your friend invite you to go do something else? Or did your friend deliver bad news that prevented you from wanting to go? The third example is much better than the first two. The tree blew over because its roots were shallow, the ground was saturated, and the wind was exceptionally strong. This is meaningful, and it certainly seems complete. It's not obvious what else could be added to the explanation to make it better. The second criterion is testability. To say that a hypothesis is testable is to say that there is, at least in principle, some way to confirm or to disconfirm it. Often this takes the form of making predictions based on the hypothesis and then testing these predictions. Now remember that when we say that we're going to test a hypothesis, that doesn't necessarily mean that we can empirically test it. In other words, it doesn't mean that our hypotheses have to be scientific. As discussed in the text, some hypotheses are philosophical, and we can use principles of logic to test those. So let's look at a couple of examples. She lashed out at us because of demon possession. Now it's not clear exactly how we could test this hypothesis. First of all, we would have to be able to test for the presence of a demon, but furthermore, we'd have to have some way to show that the demon is causing the person to act in one way rather than another. So again, it's not clear that this is a very testable hypothesis. Compare that with, the building collapsed because of metal fatigue. This is clearly a testable hypothesis. We can take some of the metal from the building and see if in fact it failed due to various stresses that were on it. The third criterion is fruitfulness. Fruitfulness literally means to bear much fruit, or to be fruitful, or to multiply. Applying this then to hypotheses, if we say that a hypothesis is fruitful, that means that it generates new research projects, and it helps to illuminate other areas of research. Now, of course, many mundane hypotheses aren't fruitful. He didn't go to the party because he was tired. So the person's tiredness explains why he didn't go to the party, but it probably doesn't explain much else. It certainly doesn't generate new research projects. Compare that to cell theory. Cell theory is the idea that all living organisms are made up of cells. This, of course, has generated all sorts of new fields of research on how organisms heal, how they grow, how they age, how they store and burn energy, and so on. Cell theory, then, is a very fruitful hypothesis. Next we have wideness of scope. To say that a hypothesis has wideness of scope is to say that it can explain multiple diverse phenomena. Now again, there are lots of explanations out there that don't explain lots of different things. For example, my computer stopped working because I spilled soda into it. My spilling soda into a computer doesn't really explain a lot of diverse things. Compare that to gene theory. Gene theory explains how children can appear similar to their parents. It can explain the inheritability of certain diseases and the evolution of species through time and the existence of identical twins and so on. 
Gene theory, then, has wideness of scope and it has been incredibly fruitful. Not surprisingly, these two criteria often go hand in hand. The next criterion is simplicity. Remember, simplicity does not contrast with complexity. Simplicity has to do with the number of unsupported or unsupportable assumptions that an explanation makes. If you watch much of the History Channel, you know that they like to talk about alien explanations. So suppose somebody says aliens helped the Egyptians build the pyramids. Well notice that if you invoke aliens to try to explain how the Egyptians did this, it makes all sorts of assumptions about the existence of aliens, about their ability to come to Earth, about their motivations for why they would want to build pyramids, and so on. And of course, there's no way to answer these questions. It is not a simple hypothesis. A much better explanation is, the Egyptians built the pyramids using slave labor and technology that we haven't yet fully figured out. Now, of course, this explanation also makes assumptions, namely that the Egyptians had the technology to do what they did. But notice how much more reasonable that is than assuming that aliens came and did it. Next we have conservatism. When we say that an explanation is conservative, it means that it preserves background knowledge or things that we think we already know. So explanations are to be preferred when they're consistent with other things that we know or think we know, unless there's compelling evidence otherwise. For example, let's think about how North Korea has wanted to engage in bilateral talks with the United States concerning their nuclear program. One hypothesis about this is to say they want to negotiate with us because they want to become a respected member of the international community and they no longer see a need for their nuclear ambitions. The problem here is that this goes very much against what we know about North Korea and its leadership. An alternative hypothesis says North Korea is eager to negotiate with the United States because it lends an air of legitimacy to their regime and allows them to stall for time as they develop their nuclear program. Now again, it's entirely possible that the current leadership of North Korea wants to change course, but unless we have compelling evidence to think otherwise, we really should stick with what we know about them. Finally, remember that we don't want our explanations to be ad hoc. To say that an explanation is ad hoc means that there's really no reason to believe it except to rescue another hypothesis. One way we can identify ad hoc hypotheses is by asking, what evidence do you have for that? If there's no answer to that question, then that tells you that the hypothesis probably is just there to prop up another explanation that you like. For example, suppose someone says, I don't think President Obama was born in the US. Somebody responds to that by saying, but they've shown us his birth certificate. And the original person comes back by saying, well, I think the doctor forged it. Saying that the doctor forged the birth certificate is ad hoc. There's really no reason to believe that. The person just says it because they're trying to prop up their original hypothesis. Now compare this to the following example. Suppose that we have somebody who is talking about the Milankovitch cycles, which concerns various aspects of Earth's orbit, and how they explain how the Earth goes in and out of ice ages. Person R objects to this hypothesis by saying, Earth warms up much too quickly when it comes out of ice ages for it to be due to the Milankovitch cycles. The person defending the Milankovitch cycle hypothesis comes back and says, the extra warming is due to extra greenhouse gases being released from areas where the ice has retreated. So in other words, S has put forward a subsidiary hypothesis to bolster their original hypothesis about the Milankovitch cycles. However, this subsidiary hypothesis is not ad hoc. There's a lot of evidence to support this subsidiary hypothesis, and so it strengthens the original hypothesis. It's a much better explanation than what we had in the previous. If you master these seven criteria, you'll have gone a long way toward being able to test the strength of hypotheses as well as their relative merit. Unfortunately, learning how to apply them is as much of an art as it is a science. It takes much practice.